So I want to say thanks to Jeff and to the Heritage Foundation, um, as well as ORF, um, for having me here today um, and for hosting a really important set of conversations with today's conference. Uh, there is obviously an exceptional group of speakers next to me. I am thrilled to be on the panel with them. Um, and this panel is going to take on some big questions today, as Jeff said. What role the U.S.-India partnership is going to play in building up the kinds of institutions and partnerships and frameworks that we need in the future to have a stable international security order. These are big issues to tackle, but we couldn't have three better panelists than the ones sitting next to me. Just to say a couple of words about who we have joining me today, Ambassador Shringla um, is current Indian ambassador to the US, and am I correct in understanding the, the youngest? This is, this is what I was told, the youngest diplomat to serve as Indian ambassador to the US. So, Go back to <laughs> <laughs> um, he's been working tirelessly to promote the U.S.-India relationship. Uh, no doubt has a busy weekend um, ahead of him. I have to say, as a former Texan, um, I give huge kudos to the Howdy Modi title. I liked that a lot. Um, and the ambassador has had a long and really successful diplomatic career, uh, spanning over 35 years. He's held a variety of positions in Delhi overseas, most recently as High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh um, and Ambassador of India to the Kingdom of Thailand. Next to me, we have Major General Michael Minahan, who's the Chief of Staff for U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. Um, and as I believe my Indo-PACOM colleagues are fond of saying, the responsibilities stretch from Hollywood to Bollywood. Um, which is particularly appropriate for today's conversations. Uh, Indo-PACOM oversees U.S. Um, engagement, military engagement and presence in a vast region of the world, has an enormous set of responsibilities. Uh, General Minahan has decades of service, uh, serving as an Air Force pilot and in a number of roles, including uh, Chief of Staff for UN Command and U.S. Forces in Seoul, South Korea, staff assignments at Headquarters Air Force, U.S. Transportation Command, and uh, Pacific Air Forces. Then finally, but certainly not least, uh, we have Sanjoy Joshi, the Chairman of the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, he has a breadth of experience, in particular looking at Indian energy and environmental policies. He spent uh, 25 years in India's administrative service, including serving as Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. He's also the founding mission director for the Watershed Development Mission, um, and subsequently the managing director of the Renewable Energy Development Agency. So as you can see, there are a number of topics uh, that our panelists can take on today. They're each going to speak for about seven to eight minutes, then we'll do some questions, and then hopefully we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, should we start, Mr. Ambassador, with you? Sure. Well, thank you very much, and good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Observer Research Foundation, in particular Samir Saran, and the Heritage Foundation, uh, Jeff Smith, uh, and others, uh, for hosting this uh, very important and timely India on the Hill event. Um, when we talk about the subject uh, of today's conversation, the India-US, uh, the new security paradigm, uh, I think it'd be important to try and uh, get a sense of where we are at this point of time and where we can go from here. And I'll, I'll try and do uh, uh, some of that. And of course, I'd be very interested in uh, listening to the views of my other esteemed panelists who would have a lot of good suggestions uh, to make in this regard. Now, uh, in the India-US uh, strategic partnership uh, has emerged as one of the key bilateral relationships uh, from the start of this uh, century and has the potential to become the defining partnership uh, within this century. Um, and, and of course, uh, it was as early as 2000, the year 2000, that uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee said that India and the US were natural allies and that the partnership was based on common interests. And more recently, in 2016, uh, it was uh, Prime Minister Modi who had said that uh, both India and the US had overcome the hesitations of history in forging a partnership that was uh, both important and strategic. Now, um, when you look at uh, uh, a partnership that emerges as a strategic one, 
Um, and uh, I think Congressman Ted Yoho uh, referred to it as a tectonic uh, shift, and, and I think that's, uh, uh, you know, it, it really illustrates that it was a dramatic shift uh, in a period of time that's relatively short. And, and to achieve uh, a policy change of that nature, obviously you need uh, not just a buy-in, but you need a, an active uh, support and endorsement of the top leadership. And I think in this regard, we've been fortunate that uh, successive US presidents and Indian prime ministers uh, over the last 15 years or so have forged a close uh, relationship, uh, which is uh, also in many cases based on personal chemistry between them. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, in, in the current instance, uh, since uh, Prime Minister Modi was re-elected in May this year, uh, you've had uh, Prime Minister Modi and President uh, Trump meet uh, twice. And uh, later this week, when President Modi uh, arrives in the United States, uh, they're scheduled to meet uh, twice more. So we'd have four meetings in the span of a few months. Uh, so it, it is really reflective of the nature of the relationship. But what we have done is that uh, I think we've also created uh, institutional mechanisms that allow the leadership uh, on both sides to meet. Uh, you've had, uh, of course, we have both India and the US are members of the G20. Uh, we've institutionalized what is called the Japan, America, India, or J uh, dialogue, the trilateral relationship at the summit level. If you add Australia to it, then you also have the court, which uh, we are now uh, looking forward to uh, commencing at the level of foreign ministers. Um, at the uh, level that is more directly involved with the strategic partnership, you have uh, the two plus two dialogue, which is the level of foreign and defense ministers. You have a defense policy dialogue. Uh, you have a, a maritime security dialogue. So you have the different elements that would go into uh, a regular and institutionalized uh, framework of discussions on how to take the strategic partnership forward and to assess uh, what you've achieved so far. Um, and of course, if you look at the defense partnership, uh, we have uh, either concluded or in the, are in the process of including most of the foundational agreements uh, from Lemoa to Kumkasa. We're making very good progress uh, on uh, Baker and the industrial security annex. And of course, India has emerged as a uh, also, uh, uh, or rather, India is looking at the United States as also a major platform for its uh, defense uh, procurements and, and equipment and technology. We're also working uh, jointly on uh, research and development in many areas of technology that's relevant to uh, both our countries. Now, in the, on the defense side, of course, um, the US is, is, is a country with whom we have among the largest, uh, most extensive military exercises. Uh, um, and uh, this year, we are going to start with what is called a tri-service exercise uh, involving all three services, um, which is going to focus on uh, HADR, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, uh, side of things, and, and I think that would be a new uh, trend in this regard. Um, besides that, of course, on the uh, counterterrorism and the security front, we have a joint working group on counterterrorism. We have a designations dialogue, which uh, jointly uh, decides uh, on individuals and entities to be designated uh, either uh, bilaterally or under the UN's uh, 1267 list. Um, and of course, uh, we have uh, a number of other, um, let's say, areas of cooperation. The building blocks of this uh, strategic partnership, the uh, security partnership that has emerged is in place. Now, um, when you look at uh, what really constitutes an area of uh, cooperation, the focus uh, has been on the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's a vast area, you mentioned from Hollywood to Bollywood, uh, and then we would uh, prefer to extend that right up to the coast of East Africa, uh, which encompasses uh, also uh, uh, parts of, uh, which encompasses the Gulf and uh, the African continent. Which we are talking about a really uh, vast region. And when you look at the Indo-Pacific, of course, it really means that uh, countries that have uh, shared values, principles, ideologies uh, come together uh, to define uh, what you believe should be uh, a region that you want to uh, uh, cooperate in and exist in, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, you know common rules-based uh, um, approach uh, to international uh, affairs, whether it is uh, the governing the rules governing the use of common spaces, or it is uh, the um, you know transparency that is associated with uh, connectivity, uh, or uh, any other uh, areas of uh, uh, cooperation that you envisage. Uh, 
in the region, including the settlement of uh, disputes uh, among states. Um, but when you talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, um, what we find in India is that it really, to some extent, dovetails with what we have, uh, what are existing concepts within our foreign and defense policy, which we are already uh, really acting upon. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, we have uh, had for some time a neighborhood first policy, which really means that our neighbors are important and we want to focus on uh, developing a relationship with our neighbors that is based on an inclusive uh, approach, uh, one that uh, encompasses uh, sharing of our development gains. When Prime Minister Modi talks of Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, which means development for all, we don't mean that we confine this just to India, we confine it also to our neighbors. Uh, for example, uh, the country where I was in uh, as a master before coming here, Bangladesh, is a country in which we have allocated up to $10 billion in, in lines of credit and, and grants in aid, which has really, uh, to some extent, helped that country achieve today uh, close to 8% growth. And as in Bangladesh has become an important partner uh, in many of the areas that uh, we work together with all our neighbors on. So uh, neighborhood post first is, is, is one of the existing uh, areas of uh, our policy framework when we deal with uh, countries in our neighborhood. There is the ACTIS policy, which really is, which really means that uh, you know your neighbors to the east of you, which really uh, means the ASEAN countries right up to Japan, are your important partners, and you need to co-op them uh, in anything that you uh, want to achieve uh, in your uh, extended neighborhood. And even within the Indo-Pacific concept, when we talk about a free, open, transparent, inclusive Indo-Pacific, uh, we uh, really look at ASEAN as uh, you know, being the central point in that uh, outreach effort. Uh, and of course, all of this is, is really encompassed in the larger concept of uh, uh, security and growth for all, which, is, uh, which we call SAGAR, which is really uh, a cooperation that is based on respect for all, uh, dialogue, uh, cooperation, uh, peace, and prosperity. Um, these are the principles on which uh, we operate. And of course, um, uh, in that context, I just want to mention a few brief words because I know that time is short, is that our approach to our neighborhood, which is our extended neighborhood, has been always based on, uh, to some extent, uh, on uh, you know, very close cooperation. And how do we achieve that cooperation? One of those is, of course, as uh, in the security and strategic framework, uh, uh, as being um, uh, first responders and net security providers. And I'll explain that uh, a little bit. Uh, when you talk about first responders, you know, you are, we exist in, a, in an area which is, uh, which is uh, prone to natural calamities. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, very frequent occurrences. And I'd, uh, of course, uh, give you the example of uh, a very uh, uh, fairly serious earthquake that occurred in the Sulawesi province of Indonesia last year in which uh, our aircraft were the first to respond with uh, relief equipment uh, in Indonesia. Uh, earlier this year in April, uh, Mozambique suffered from very heavy cyclones. Again, our naval ships were there to provide uh, assistance. When the Maldives ran out of water, our ships were there with drinking water. When Sri Lanka had uh, an issue uh, again with the cyclone, uh, our ships were there. Bangladesh had to deal with an influx of uh, close to 400,000 uh, refugees from the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Um, uh, it was a humanitarian disaster in the making. Uh, our aircraft were there uh, within uh, a few days. And I must say that uh, here, uh, the recent acquisition of heavy lift capacity that we had from the United States in the form of the C-17 Globemaster came in as a very, very uh, useful uh, instrument of that delivery of uh, assistance. So first responders really means that you're there for your friends, your neighbors, your partners, uh, and that when disaster strikes, difficult times happens, then we are available. The uh, concept of a net security provider is, again, in the same mode. We work with our uh, neighbors and partners uh, to ensure that uh, shipping lanes are free of uh, piracy, so counter piracy, counter terrorism, but also cooperation in the form of white shipping, um, AI systems, uh, cooperation in the form of dealing with our partners on brain pollution, uh, in areas that uh, all our friends are comfortable with, right from Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia, down to, Mad uh, to Mozambique uh, and, uh, and countries uh, in the Gulf. So, um, and we've, we've forged very good partnerships uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean region with Seychelles and uh, 
Mauritius, at the same time with Sri Lanka uh, and Maldives, and on the, uh, on the Bay of Bengal with uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand. Uh, with all of these countries, we have coordinated patrols, we have uh, search and rescue, uh, and we have uh, joint search and rescue, and I think we have developed mechanisms by which we cooperate. Our navies cooperate very, very um, uh, fruitfully on areas that help both countries. There is a mutuality of benefit here. And when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, we look, look at really extending the same uh, posit positivity with our friends, uh, with the United States, with Japan, with our other partners in extending this outreach in a cooperative manner that could uh, include and co-opt as many countries in this larger concept of uh, what we believe uh, should be uh, a region of uh, a shared uh, security and growth and shared prosperity and uh, and development uh, for countries uh, in the in the area and i think the success of the indo-pacific and the success of a larger strategic partnership lies in in an approach that uh, involves and includes uh, incorporates as many of our partners and friends uh, within uh, this region and beyond as possible i'll stop there because i know that you have a time constraint thank, thank you very much mr ambassador um general minahan can i turn to you absolutely I agree with everything he just said. <laughs> Easy. I'm going to save. I'm going to save a little time here. First of all, good morning. My name is Mike Minahan. Uh, it's an honor to be here. All my operational experience is in the sand in the Middle East, and all my staff experience is in the Pacific. So I've done two tours in Korea. I started out at Pacific Air Forces, and then this is my second time at Indo Paycom. But when I went to Korea and came back, the name of Paycom had changed. Um, I think it's an acknowledgement of the, the importance of this relationship in addition to the geography. Ambassador, I don't think I can explain it any better than you. Dr. Barry over there is my handler, and he actually has electrocution things hooked up to me if I go wrong. He told me very clearly last week, stick to the script, and that's exactly what I'm not going to do right now. <laughs> if he stands up and says what the general meant to say, um, then you'll just have to uh, forgive me a little bit. Um, but, but to save some time and just to accentuate, I thought what the am ambassador expressed very well in the, in the military domain, uh, when you start out with our, our shared values and principles that only two large liberal democracies can have, that is an enormous foundation uh, from which to build. You add in um, the, the commitment by two countries to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, all the dialogues the ambassador discussed, the multitude of agreements that add to the strength of that foundation from the original Jasomia to the 2 plus 2 Kamkasa to the Lamoa uh, to the Becca and, and hopefully more. You lay the platforms on top of those agreements, which in the military realm provide enormous connectivity and sense of common purpose when you are operating P-8s together and Apaches together and C-17s together and C-130s together and CH-47s together and Sea Guardians together and, and the HH-60s, uh, you just have a commonality that will bring not only a sense of purpose but a understanding and a, and a friendship and partnership that's just extremely strong and very meaningful in the military realm. Add on top of that a sense of, as, as the ambassador described, outreach, whether it's just uh, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific or as he described, being first responders. I had the honor uh, in 2015 to lead the air component uh, response to the Nepal earthquake out of Utapau, Thailand. And we relied heavily on the Indian Armed Forces, not only that C-17 capability, but the ability to push uh, uh, a combined alliance of air power up into Nepal to, uh, to do that initial responding. Those initial first responder, whether you're in a Hatter response or a counterterrorism response or a, or a search and rescue response, like for the Malaysian airliner, that familiarity of platform, but also the working level ability to command and control, to truly integrate, coordinate, understand each other's capabilities and provide that much needed effort um, can only come with routine operations, patrols, and operating together. I don't think any of the challenges uh, that, that were described last night or today are unique to the U.S.-India relationship. Uh, the closest of friends, the closest of partners always have challenges that we have to work through. 
I came from Korea. We've been sitting in the same desk side by side for many years, and I can tell you that the challenges there are, are, are present, but they are things that are worked through regardless of who's in power, regardless of what the external pressures are. Um, that military foundation of relationship teams tends to be very stable and accommodating when it comes to still handling all those challenges. So I thought there were two, and Chatham House rules last night, so non-attributable, but there are two great questions that came up that I'll just leave as I transition. Uh, one is, uh, it was out of a different context, but what's next? So we talked about the agreements, we talked about the dialogues, and we talked about the platforms, what's next? Um, I think that's a fair, uh, that's a fair question. Uh, and then, then one that was also brought out, out last night was what does it mean to be a major defense partner? So I look forward to the dialogue later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Joshi, can I turn to you? Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's always been a pleasure being at the Heritage Foundation. I've been coming here, I think, ever since I joined ORF, which has now been 10 years. And I don't think there's been any single year in these 10 years when I've not been at the Heritage Foundation. So thank you for being such uh, you know, great hosts and having us ORF back in these portals uh, time and again. Uh, we've had such excellent presentations that I think we can just open the floor up uh, for questions. So I will uh, just very briefly uh, you know, take forward some of the ideas which have been put on the table by Ambassador Tringler and uh, General Minion. Uh, when we start talking about the strategic relationship between uh, the U.S. and India, I mean, it's uh, commonly we talk of the three things which get us together. The first is uh, the nature of our political value systems, which bring us together. Second is, of course, the growth trajectory of India, India becoming a $5 trillion economy, then a $10 trillion economy over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and that economic partnership, which is at the core of this relationship. But third and most important, which is uh, something Ambassador Shringla hinted at and spoke about, is has been the larger evolving geomatrix, matrix as in the movie matrix, uh, which has been responsible for bringing these two countries together over the turn of the century. Uh, around the time when the century turned, you know, the, the whole focus of the world, the attention of the world, came to be riveted upon this one region of the world, which was the Indo-Pacific. There were transformations happening. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, in spite of, in spite of the very acrimonious relationships which India and uh, the US had uh, post poker and two, when India was slapped under sanctions, it took just not even 10 years for us to reach a stage where you know, we, 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 we went into 2005 and concluded the US-India Defense Partnership, which ultimately led to the one, two, three agreement, which was an exceptional agreement, uh, this, which, which came to be called the Civil Nuclear Deal. This happened within 10 years of Pokhran. Now, these were some of the remarkable shifts which were happening around the world. And that was the reason why successive administrations, we are both very cantankerous democracies. We fight within ourselves all the time. And that is, that is actually what is also common between us. But in spite of all that, in spite of who came and who went, this was a relationship which went on and has been moving on and gathering steam over the years through successive administrations. So let me just briefly talk about this, you know, the, the unfolding geometrics which actually brings us together and what has brought us together. Yes, the Indo-Pacific, and very commonly uh, it has been described within this geometrics, when we talk of the Indo-Pacific, there are convergences and divergences. Let us accept it. And there will always be what we have between us is not a hackneyed Hollywood romance or a Bollywood romance. No, it, it, it is a, the, the theater of the Indo-Pacific is a complex theater. It is the drama which is being played out has got various plots and various subplots. And because of that, there are going to be divergences there are going to be convergences. And, and yes, we need to talk about them and discuss about them. And the convergences, we talk about the divergences, Ambassador Shingla just briefly hinted at. From the US definition of the Indo-Pacific, from Hollywood to Bollywood, there's a problem. Because the influence of Bollywood, unfortunately, does not stop on India's Western shores. 
Bollywood is very popular in West Asia. It penetrates deep into Africa. The three Khans are household names in every Moroccan home. They, they are known there. So India's, India keeps on looking at its Western starboard. And when we talk about India's Act East policy, the Act East policy is part and parcel of India's Western engagement. It, it is part and parcel of it. And that is something which needs to be understood. And that is often what does, yes, lead to our divergences. So when we start talking about India's Western arc and we start talking about how it is not distinct from its Act East policy, the fundamental fact is that there is an Asia, when we talk about this larger drama unfolding in Asia, what is this larger drama unfolding? As far as India is concerned, there is a project of the integration of Africa, Eurasia, and Asia at work. There's a large project at work out there. And from where we sit, it is our very, very clear perception that this project of integration cannot be. It cannot be a China-centric project tied by the BRI. Now, there, there are differences there. BRI, yes, can be one of the projects. It can be part of the matrix, but it cannot be exclusively the single matrix that operates here. So we, we believe that this has to be a far more diverse project, as diverse as these, these, these three continents themselves are. It has to be diverse. It has to be bottom up. There have to be many more players in the game. And therefore, India, sitting where it does, is in the process, is in the process of building partnerships which cobble together these coalitions, these arrangements, which make for a much more diverse arrangement of integration. And why that is necessary, you see, over, over the next few decades, there is this very important need to lay down the infrastructure networks, the digital highways that will power the growth of the 21st century. And that is going to happen in this region that is happening across this region. That involves the reformulation and reconfiguration of the global China-centric value chains, which have dominated the world in the last two decades. The changes in these value chains are being demanded by three things. Now, first of all, the changes in these value chains are being demanded by the shifting demographics of this region, the way these countries are growing, the way the, way the, the, way the demographics are shifting, the way the demand, the, where, where the largest concentration of youth lies in the world, it is here. Second, they're being demanded by the trade disparities that have led to the current trade wars. That's the second thing which is demanding that these value chains be, be reconfigured. And third, they are going to be shaped by the very different modes of manufacturing uh, that are going to be put in place by the fourth industrial revolution. That is another major shift which is going to be happening over the next few years. And all three are demanding the reconfiguration of these value chains. So these are responsible for India's engagements on its Western starboard, whether these engagements are with Iran, whether these engagements are with Russia, they, they are very important part of this matrix, which has to be evolving over the next few years. So therefore, there are three things in brief, let me just conclude, which the US and India need to do. Now, first, we need to share and appreciate an assessment of the new emerging security geographies. And yes, there will be differences in perceptions there. But we need to share it, understand it, because there is, I fundamentally see, a much larger convergence at work here in our visualizations and definition of the Indo-Pacific, and not just of the Indo-Pacific, of Afro-Eurasia, and going forward, even of how the Arctic unfolds. Second, you know, where our mental maps and our strategic conceptualizations over the shared space do not converge, the US will need to cede policy space to India and not be the veto power it has been in its alliances, both with the EU and in East Asia. Now, whether it is the US relationship with Pakistan, where India, India has no ambition of controlling this relationship and does not want to control this relationship, or then of India's strategic relationships with Russia and Iran, where it will continue to seek adequate space from the United States. And third and lastly, you know, as India and the US work to develop a shared security engagement 
which means you know, serving a rules-based order, one that accommodates the foreign policy interests of both sides. They will need to look at a defense partnership that moves beyond just counting the defense sales numbers of $18 billion, $19 billion, and $20 billion. It needs to move beyond that. The real opportunity and challenge, actually, lies in creating a joint Indo-US military industrial architecture capable of integrating US and Indian supply chains together. And not just US and Indian supply chains, these supply chains across other like-minded countries across the world. Now, that is what we need to move towards. And for instance, you, know, you have the joint venture between Tata and Lockheed Martin. You need to have multiple of these, a lot of these coming into place. So, and I think, you know, whereas blunt instruments like the CATSA do not work, the US designation of India as a major defense partner allows for the operationalization of these objectives, uh, which I've talked about. Because it creates an exceptional architecture for a unique partnership with India. Now, the leadership somehow, you know, beyond the bureaucracies, which, which, which gets stuck in the trades commissions and niggling at the WTO, it keeps getting stuck and gets desperate about these things. The, the, the larger architecture of this relationship seems to be falling into place with an arrangement which sees that there is the need for flexibility in this, in this institutional arrangement. And that is why the MDP has been an extremely important step in, in moving this forward. See, ultimately, yes, uh, we are both, both democracies. Our political landscape will constantly change, and our societies and people, the fact is, continue to derive their energy, their creativity, and their constant ability to reinvent themselves from this flux and change. That is our strength. It is not our weakness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I want to get started on some questions, and, and actually, I'm going to first pose a question to all three of our panelists. Um, so we heard a lot of discussion about the um, tremendous growth in the U.S.-India bilateral partnership over the last decade and the degree to which there's a lot of strategic alignment between our countries, um, not just based on our common values as large democracies, but also a growing sense of shared interests. Um, and I think that here in particular, one area where there has been particular convergence in strategic viewpoints between the United States and India in recent years is obviously how to address China's growth in the region. However, when we talk about great power relationships, the US and India may have slightly different viewpoints on how we approach Russia. So I'd like to ask everyone if you could just comment your thoughts on where the US and India are aligned and maybe where we have divergences and how we think about great power relations um, and how we work through some of those divergences. Who would like to start? No, I think I already uh, spoke about, uh, when, I, when I spoke of the divergences, India and Russia, yes, have had a long-standing relationship. And that was a relationship which uh, developed during the days of the Cold War. Uh, there, is, there is a history behind it. There's also history behind how India's uh, uh, economic architecture, its entire industrial infrastructure was built up with Russian help. That is, that is one part of it. But moving beyond the Cold War, you know, post, post the Cold War era, there has been this other very, very uh, strong shifting dynamic developing between the Asian powers, between China, Russia, and India, where India needs to play a part between, you know, between the growing relationship which has started emerging between Russia and China. And India can play an important balancing part. That is why you had the prime minister recently going to Vladivostok. And we, we had a number of arrangements signed with the Russians. This is an important relationship which for the sake of Asia, which for the larger project which I talked about, which is ultimately Africa, Europe, and Asia, you know, come, uh, getting integrated together through very different and diverse projects which has been happening. There is skin in the game for everybody in this. There is skin in the game also for the United States of America in this. And this is precisely where you know, I see this as 
a complementarity. I see this as a foil. India's relationships in Asia are actually that foil which can make the critical difference to step in in many ways where the U.S. cannot with very different kinds of relationships. These are important for, you, for the U.S. also, and they're equally important for India. Excellent. General Minahan, Mr. Ambassador. I think that uh, shared values, rules-based order, free and open Indo-Pacific is all the guidance I need in that anything that challenges access to the global commons, sea, air, maritime, space, cyberspace, uh, you know, would fall into what would be a subset of, of, of the greater alignment. So it, there's no mistake. You can go to SecDef's comments at Newport last week that China is, is the big challenge and that there is a challenge that there are, that they are there is friction to uh, between their goals and our shared interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific to all of those domains. So uh, I see I see enough in the grand vision that gives Indo-PACOM and the mill-to-mill -mill relationship all it needs for the alignment. Well, I, I think I really would agree with uh, you know, both panelists. Uh, you're coming from different points of view, but the fact of the matter is that uh, when you talk about um, you know a strategic, uh, let's say, environment uh, in which uh, you have uh, developed uh, a very um, strong partnership with the United States uh, in a very short period of time, um, uh, it really uh, is something that uh, both countries uh, uh, should see mutual benefit from and are seeing mutual benefit from. At the same time, um, what we are not uh, really looking at is uh, an ex uh, and a relationship that would be mutually exclusive as far as your other uh, partners are concerned. Um, in other words, um, while uh, this relationship, which is based on shared values and principles, will continue to grow, and develop and, and prosper. Um, uh, as far as India is concerned, it is also important for us to keep open uh, the channels of communication that have traditionally existed. Uh, in the case of Russia, of course, uh, it comes from before the Cold War. Um, and uh, it, it also uh, really is uh, an important aspect of our current uh, security preparedness as well. And after all, uh, a vast amount of our defense platforms are uh, Russian. Uh, we hold a very large inventory of spares, uh, which is uh, Russian, and we can't simply uh, overlook uh, those factors. Um, I don't know what the rules, is it Chatham House rules that exist here? Or no. Is it, uh, it isn't, okay. So um, maybe I should stop there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what fair I'm, fair what, enough. What, what I'm, just to, to conclude, what we're talking about really is that, uh, that uh, and what, uh, uh, Ms. Joshi said was that it really is something that shouldn't be seen in that context either because the relationships that we have with uh, uh, with China and with Russia uh, are those that could also be uh, of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, some benefit uh, to the United States in ways that uh, are not always tangible. Uh, with China, is it's a more complicated relationship because they're a neighbor of us. They're an immediate neighbor. We have common borders. Um, and uh, and uh, what we uh, really uh, believe is that uh, um, it's important uh, that there is an engagement and that we are not looking at uh, a situation which is, uh, you know, necessarily uh, in any way confrontational, but an engagement that uh, could, uh, in some senses, uh, you know, derive benefits from areas like trade. Uh, you have a strong, the United States has a strong trade relationship with China. It's, it's, it's of course, both the U.S. and we would like to recalibrate it because we do believe that the current levels of uh, trade are not sustainable in terms of the adverse balances. Both uh, India also has a very significant adverse trade balance with China, and one of our major planks of engagement with China is to try and address that issue. Uh, but also uh, the issue of, uh, on the other hand, of technology, and what is technology that is uh, 
not just appropriate and and uh, reasonable, but also in terms of what are your larger security interests and where this technology could fit in or where uh, you need to be, um, you know, looking at it and reviewing that. So uh, these are complex issues, and and uh, one of the issues that comes up very often is uh, our defense partnership with Russia. Um, you know, uh, fact of the matter is that. Uh, um, the as our relationship uh, with the United States, uh, States grows as a major defense partner, uh, we have uh, really uh, seen a spike in that uh, area of cooperation. Uh, and this cuts across all areas of cooperation. It's not just procurement, as Mr. Joshi pointed out, but it encompasses uh, training, it encompasses uh, joint exercises, it encompasses, uh, you know, working together on HADR activities, uh, vast range in joint research and development uh, um, that is happening. Uh, and at the same time, I think, uh, you know, we can't overlook uh, a factor of a certain level of uh, uh, dependency on, on uh, Russian platforms, which is also essential. Uh, and sometimes absolutely uh, necessary for our uh, security preparedness, which we believe the United States should be understanding of. Uh, as a strategic partner, it also means understanding of your uh, you know, partners' engagements, uh, which uh, are essential for their own uh, security uh, and uh, existential uh, requirements. So I'll just stop there, and we'll see how we can. Thank you very much. General Minahan, I want to follow up on the question of the defense relationship for a minute. Um, we heard a, a litany of um, really significant achievements that have been made in the bilateral India US-India relationship uh, over the past several years. But I want to ask also a priority for the United States has been not just to enhance its bilateral relationships, but to think about how to perhaps better network mm. some of our defense relationships together. Um, obviously, the topic of the, uh, the Quad uh, has gotten a lot of attention. But there's also a lot of progress being made um, between the United States, India, Japan, um, and Australia uh, at tri-level trilateral levels as well in the defense relationships. So what do you see as some of the biggest opportunities for further strengthening some of those multilateral defense networks as well? Well, I think as described specifically with the, your earlier China question is there's enough challenge out there that no one country uh, can, can ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific without extreme amount of partnerships, allies, and multilateral. You know, so there is a network of allies, mutual defense treaties that exist throughout the indo pacom AOR. India is a partnership, a strong partnership, and that needs to exist in a multilateral nature. So you described Australia, Japan, Philippines, I would throw in there. Any like-minded nation that uh, has a vested interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific that believes in rule-based order, that believes in access to the global commons, I think uh, there is room in the security ar architecture, whatever you call it, but partnership and multilat is wonderful, that there is a need to operationalize those relationships mill to mill with joint sales or, or patter or counterterrorism or information sharing or imagery sharing, all that. I think is where, where Indo-PACOM is, is putting its focus in. It's foundational to the approach that Indo-PACOM is taking. There is the, the, the partnership, um, partners and allies, is one of the, the four core tenets of, of what Admiral Davidson is focusing on. And I see the India relationship as, as center to that as we move forward. Great, thank you. Mr. Ambassador, a topic that you brought up, we, we've been talking a lot about security. One thing that is, um, equally important when we think about shared security is, is the idea of our economic security as well. Um, U.S.-India bilateral trade has grown phenomenally over the past decade. I think annual bilateral goods and services trade has, has doubled um, in the last decade. We've had some bumps perhaps in the road in recent months, um, and now perhaps maybe seeing some light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, so could you talk to me about what you see as some of the biggest priorities um, and opportunities when we think about how to enhance the U.S.-India economic partnership? 
Well, for any uh, economic relationship that has uh, developed so quickly, and as you say, our trade has doubled in the last 10 years, and potentially can double again in the next five years. We're looking at $280 billion in the next five years. Um, and also very significant two-way investments. And U.S. companies have invested significantly in India. But uh, interestingly, Indian companies have also invested significantly in the United States, creating value, creating jobs. And I think that's an important uh, factor because this is a two-way exchange. So there is a mutuality of interest and benefit in that economic partnership that we're talking about. And there are other factors to it, like technology, um, access to technology. Uh, Prime Minister Modi did uh, say that uh, the U.S. is India's uh, partner of choice when it comes to our uh, socioeconomic transformation through our flagship initiatives and schemes. And so um, uh, when it comes to trade, investments, technology, uh, the U.S. is among our foremost partners and one that we have, I think, uh, really uh, both countries have benefited from. But when you have such a relationship that has developed so fast, you're bound to have certain issues that come up um, at the policy realm, at, at, the, at the realm of uh, market access and so on and so forth. And that is what we're dealing with today. And, uh, uh, and I think um, these are not necessarily issues that uh, um, are um, significant enough to impact on the larger relationship. Uh, I have described them as uh, minor speed bumps as you come along the way. And I think we will be vindicated in that because uh, both our, uh, you know, respective uh, authorities that deal with these issues are in close contact. Uh, as we speak, uh, they are in touch in trying to see how we can address some of the issues that are there. Uh, some will need a little more time, but there are others that can be, uh, I think, um, resolved uh, more quickly. And I think we're looking at how we can uh, prioritize those and, and move forward. So I have no doubt that we will see uh, uh, not only uh, a speedy resolution of some of the issues that uh, constitute trade, trade differences between our sides, and also on the issue of uh, investment policy. Uh, we have uh, taken an approach that uh, emphasizes continued liberalization for investment regime. And recent steps that have been taken uh, really also uh, uh, point in that direction of liberalizing the insurance sector, the civil aviation sector, the media sector, and sectors that matter in terms of uh, single brand retail to U.S. companies uh, that uh, are uh, have invested in India. And I think that will also see uh, a significant change. And we're also looking at other policy changes that could assist in a greater involvement of uh, <clears throat> U.S. companies in India and vice versa. So uh, take the case of uh, Indian involvement in the United States. Uh, last year, we, for the first time, purchased $4.5 billion of oil and gas from the United States. Uh, President Trump, in a State of the Union address, said that the United States had emerged for the first time as a net exporter of energy, and we are an important partner in that regard. Uh, this year, that could be taken up double. We could double that. We are also looking at significant investments in the energy sector in the United States. So we become partners in the energy sector. In the next uh, few decades, 25% uh, of total growth in the energy sector uh, would, uh, would be accounted for by India. So we are major consumers of energy. The United States is now a major net exporter of energy. We have to see how best to, to capitalize on, on those interests and take it forward. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the prime minister would be uh, meeting uh, the top 15 CEOs of the energy sector in Houston, which is the global uh, energy hub. And I think uh, the, all of this augurs well for a relationship that is based, as I said, on a mutuality of uh, benefit terms. Thank you very much. Speaking of energy relationships, uh, Mr. Joshi, my last question uh, comes over to you. You, in your remarks, referenced uh, West Asia, which um, for those of us in the United States, uh, we usually know as the Middle East. Um, but I think speaks to um, perhaps uh, you know different conceptions of how we how we think about the Indo-Pacific region. India uh, has growing ties in West Asia. And a lot of that reflects India's own increasing security needs. Um, as we're looking at a moment where um, there is growing instability in the Middle East and in the Gulf region right now, where do you see um, the US and India as being aligned or not in how we approach that part of the world? And are there opportunities for greater bilateral cooperation there between the US and India? Uh, I think as far as the question of energy supplies are concerned, India and the U.S. are both on the same page. 
there's, there can be absolutely no divergence between it. We are committed to ensuring that energy you know, supplies stay constant. And there is constant growth in energy supplies. Prices are kept at reasonable levels. And we, we, we are absolutely, you know, India's economy is impacted extremely severely every time uh, the price of oil spikes. You could see India's markets crash, you know, hugely. The day oil prices shot up by 14 to 15% in a single day after the attack on Saudi Aramco's uh, refineries yeah. in the US. So therefore, maintaining supplies from West Asia, that is one of the reasons why India has built very strong relationships with its core energy suppliers which includes Saudi Arabia, which incidentally is also in the past included Iran. So, and the United States of America, as it emerges as a big exporter of both oil and gas, is definitely one of the strong partners which India looks forward to seeing in the future. But there's a bigger cooperation actually going on because as you see, the energy game is changing. The energy markets are shifting. You know, there, there is, there's much more happening beneath the surface in the energy space. Uh, where there is potential for a far deeper relationship between the US and India. And I'm talking about new technologies. I'm not just talking about uh, new technologies in uh, renewables. I'm also talking about new technologies in modular uh, liquefied natural gas, which are under development. I'm talking about new technologies developing in modular nuclear, uh, which the US is a leader of, and which are going to be core for India and a lot of other countries like India in the next 10, 15, 25 years. So there is in the energy space a huge amount of vacant space, which both countries can step into in the next few years. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I want to turn the floor over for, for questions from all of you for a while. Um, if you could raise your hand, and then do we have someone with a microphone? Right there, perfect. Um, and if I could ask folks to identify yourself, um, and also if you could frame your remarks in the form of a question and not a comment, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question in the back. Yeah, good morning, General. My question is to you. I'm J.V. Shirgal, I'm a spokesperson of a political party in India. Uh, Admiral Davidson spoke at the Raisina Dialogue this year, and he spoke about Indo-Pacific free trade and importance of court. But subject to factual correction, I believe he's in Singapore and on March 6th or 7th for a conference on court. And he made a statement that he spoke to his India counterpart, and quad actually may be shelved because there is no real potential there, and he attributed that to Admiral uh, Sunil Lamba. So you think its quad is more of a stillborn child, or because of the deep diversity, there is a real threat to it? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm unfamiliar of the the comments that you referenced. So, um, you know, so you're gonna. I think you'll, I'll give you an unsatisfying answer, but I'll go back to the one I already gave. <laughs> um, there is a place for multilateralism uh, to deal with the challenges of this AOR. So I, it doesn't matter to me if you call it. Uh, a quad or a trilat or a multilat or a bilat that that the need for like-minded nations to come together uh, to handle the challenges is going to be a need that's that's never satisfied. So there's there's plenty of work to be done. I think that when you look at the the nations of the quad, there's a lot of similarities. So it's hard for me to believe that that there's not a future, but um, you know that's at a much higher level than me. Uh, for, for militaries that need to work together, it's, it's not that hard to imagine multiple scenarios where that multi-lat team will have to get together and handle a mission. So I, I hope the way you describe it isn't, isn't true and that there is a, that, that there is a way forward uh, for that. I, maybe I could address the last question. Um, I believe there was some confusion in the conversation because the commander was asked about a naval quad and whether one exists. And as of right now, there's not uh, a naval component. There's not in India, Australia, Japan, U.S. Um, quadrilateral exercise taking place. I think that's what he was referencing. Mm -hmm. And somehow the remarks got blown up to, to mean the quadrilateral strategic dialogue, which, which we are holding, which is very much alive, which many of us do find 
very important. Um, so actually, my question would be to Ambassador Shringla and, and Mr. Joshi. Um, what do you see as the most important uh, multilateral security forums and dialogues now? You know, many people believe that the India, US, Japan trilateral strategic dialogue has been one of the best places to advance security cooperation at, at a robust pace, um, maybe more so than the Quad, and through bilateral avenues. So where are uh, the best mechanisms now? Where sh should we be putting our energy and attention? Is it at the bilateral? Is it at the trilateral? Do we need more multilateral security dialogues? Are we content with building upon what's already there? Or do we need to be adding new layers to this matrix? Thank you. Well, um, as far as uh, India is concerned, we've had uh, traditionally a number of, uh, you know, uh, beyond bilateral relationships, what we call plurilateral, uh, let's say, uh, arrangements. Um, and these uh, are in many senses, uh, you know, interlocking and overlapping. In other words, you could be a member of uh, the BRICS, uh, that's, uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And at the same time, uh, you could be a, a member of, uh, say, uh, uh, the Japan, America, India uh, cooperation, uh, or you could be a member of the Russia, India, China cooperation, or uh, India, Brazil, South Africa. And, you know, these countries in many senses are, uh, you know, present in one form or the other in some of these arrangements. Now, as far as um, uh, the Japan, America, India uh, um, trilateral is concerned, uh, or even, uh, you know, the concept of the court, these are really new and emerging uh, arrangements. Uh, we've had uh, two meetings of uh, the Japan, America, India um, the trilateral uh, summits um, in Buenos Aires and in Osaka. And I think uh, the idea is that these summits would be held uh, every time there's a G20 meeting in the margins of those meetings. Uh, so this is an emerging concept and one that uh, that uh, needs uh, uh, much more, um, I would say, uh, uh, regularity before uh, they emerge further from this. The Quad at, at this point of time has been at uh, at the DG level. Uh, and as you call it, it's, it's a strategic interface at the DG level. And again, one that uh, really needs uh, more time to uh, to come and to uh, you know uh, and take a shape of its own, and so these are emerging uh, concepts that are uh, well need to, need to be uh, fleshed out further, need to be taken f uh, further, and and I'm sure uh, they would uh, find a certain uh, sort of uh, 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 reasoning and justification for a larger and more expanded sort of uh, 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 you know say uh, involvement. Now, um, whether we should uh, go in for other such uh, formats is really uh, between uh, uh, us. I think the, the US-India partnership has always been based on a strong bilateral construct. And that bilateral construct uh, today, I think, is uh, in a position where we can reach out and incorporate other partners that come into our, uh, let's say, uh, into this uh, arrangement. I mean, uh, Japan is one that enjoys close relations with both uh, India and the United States. And therefore, as a natural partner, that you would uh, uh, co-opt into any arrangement that involves uh, countries cooperating together, talking to each other. And what we're doing today is really talking to each other. And that is what we should be doing. We should be having our leaders uh, talk to each other. We should be having uh, our officials talk to each other. And, and, and then and thereby um, creating the basis for a larger uh, cooperative arrangement that could be, as I said, to the mutual benefit of all countries concerned. So. Um, um, these arrangements are really uh, areas where you come together, you exchange views, you, uh, and most of these plurilateral arrangements, and I mentioned a few of them, uh, are not outcome based. They're really, uh, uh, you know, arrangements whereby the leaders and others from these countries can come together and talk about uh, and exchange views on, 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 on various issues. And I think that itself is a very helpful thing. Uh, if you uh, are talking to uh, leaders from countries that are, um, you know, have a certain uh, uh, partnership with you at the bilateral level, you come together and you talk at regional levels, it, it I think clears a lot of, uh, um, uh, first of all, enables you to look at uh, what you're respectively doing. And if there are any differences, those can be aired out. And you can also look at where you can cooperate. So th they're helpful arrangements uh, as we see that. But I think uh, Mr. Joshi might want to add more to that uh, from 
I would just like to add uh, this little bit that, uh, you know, so far, one of the fundamental, uh, I'll go back to what the keynote speaker said, tried to say this morning, that a sound, secure relationship actually needs to have very strong economic underpinnings. And a weakness of the Quad strategy in the past had been that it only had a security architecture. It lacked a more comprehensive economic architecture, you know, which would become the base of that bigger security architecture. Uh, I, 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 kept, I keep speaking about the changing matrix and what has been happening in the continent. For the Quad to move forward, you know, there has to be a very strong architecture that lays down what the people on the ground need. And the fundamental things where people on the ground are crying out for are jobs and infrastructure. That is a need, that is a demand. Now those postures have been changing within members of the Quad, which is a good sign. And these have been happening uh, bilaterally. These have been happening plurilaterally. And there is a gradual shift happening when India and Japan meet, when India and South Korea meet, when India and ASEAN meet. A lot of these issues are getting discussed. And they are not just uh, you know, bilateral projects which are getting discussed. Uh, what are getting discussed are larger projects. For example, you know, before the sanctions kicked in uh, on Iran, there was discussion, deep discussions between India and Japan on what to do with the INSTC, how the INSTC should be move, moving ahead. There have been core discussions on how investments in Africa should proceed, how should they move forward. So what you are seeing is, you know, bit by bit, it, it's a very complex jigsaw puzzle. The pieces, we are not doing a top-down centralized model like the BRI, but the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are being put up bottom up slowly, slowly, bit by bit, and that's what we need to do. So you are going to need multiple such arrangements, and you need to have many such conversations in many forums at various levels. Thank you. There are questions in the front? Good morning. My, my name is Prasad Kadambi. I'm a, a nuclear safety consultant uh, in civil nuclear. <laughs> of power. Uh, Mr. Joshi, could you elaborate on what you said about small modular reactors and uh, cooperation in the nuclear space? Because my biggest interest is uh, getting some forward movement on the US-India nuclear deal and its uh, you know, promise of uh, growth in the technology overall. See, I'm at the moment speaking about technologies, and I'm speaking about uh, uh, the way ahead because uh, the single largest roadblock in development of uh, nuclear plants, large nuclear power plants, has been this problem of not in my backyard. And wherever you try to put up these large nuclear power plants, there are always protests which keep on arising because of this issue. So there have been you know, various companies across the world working on uh, commercializing modular technologies in nuclear, which is, uh, and not just nuclear, I'm also here talking about uh, in uh, liquefied natural gas, Talk, you know, small modular units where you decentralize uh, the kind of energy production which takes place rather than concentrate it in one area. So you can have small scale, both nuclear plants, LNG fired plants, uh, many of these technologies are in the process of being commercialized. Some licenses, one or two licenses, have been given out in, in the U.S. Uh, it is a very, very, I would say, uh, fledgling field developing, but I see great future for it. Thank you. Um, my name is Raju Kutsureger. Uh I have a question for uh, Major Midian. Uh, the defense assets uh, require, you know, cohesion and communication across, and I think you sort of alluded to it. Mm -hmm. But you also heard this, uh, the issue about having other disparate uh, hardware from other countries. Um, it worked very well for, you know, in the NATO environment so far, but now you, there's another NATO ally, Turkey, which also has a, a di different hardware. So how would you... How would you handle it logistically? Yeah. Um, the, 
the challenges of equipment talking to each other are not unique to partners and allies. There's enormous challenges within the U.S. just amongst the services too. So, you know, a lot of it speaks to not just where you buy your uh, where your where your equipment is made, but also when it was bought, right? You know that there's uh, always, especially with the leading edge military technology, um, you know, it's very expensive and, and, and hard to replace and keep up with uh, the modern technology. Um, so I would answer, I can't comment on the NATO piece, but I, I would answer this, that uh, when it comes to integrating military forces, it's as much about systems being able to talk as it is about standards and protocols and just procedures. Um, so there is, there are ways that we can be interoperable um, with equipment that is not the same. Um, but in this case, we have, we have a lot of opportunity to have a lot of commonality, and I think that we should build on that. That doesn't mean everything uh, and every piece of equipment can uh, or platform can do that. Um, but certainly in a modern sense, there's a foundation of commonality that's, uh, that's very good and, and, and pretty unique in the AOR. Uh, as well. So, uh, you know, like I described earlier, it's not limited to just the, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and India, but these exist within the U.S. Armed Forces and also with all, all, all our partners and allies. So, um, but the one thing that brings us together is operating, um, as the ambassador described, in a joint and combined environment routinely uh, to make those operations complex so that by the time you are operating on a real mission, that you have those standards and protocols that ensure that that connectivity is there. Thank you, General. Additional questions? In the back. Uh, Tanvi Milan from Brookings. I wonder if all of you could lay out a vision for where you see US-India relations in an ideal world 10 years from now, in terms of the security partnership, the economic one, but even beyond that, Sanjay talked about uh, the energy partnership. But are there some concrete kind of, not deliverables as such, but could you give us that vision of what you'd like to see 10 years from now? Tommy likes to ask easy questions. Uh, no. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you uh, how um, we see a strategic partnership. Our strategic partnership uh, with the United States is not uh, really looking at it from a short-term perspective, and I think you alluded to that when you talked about 10 years, but we're looking at it several years down the line. Uh, it has to be seen as a long-term partnership. It should not be seen in the prism of, uh, you know, four or five years. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, you know, within the realm of uh, you know, normal governments that... Uh, are uh, a part of uh, the democratic process of both our countries. It's important that uh, a strategic partnership is regarded in a long-term perspective and one that uh, you could plan for accordingly. And uh, that sort of prospective planning uh, and a clear uh, outline of how you see this evolving is something that both countries have been attempting to work at. When you talk about the major defense partnership, and it is the major defense partnership because the United States doesn't have any other major defense partner, uh, what defines a major defense partnership? Uh, what are the elements of that? And how do we use that uh, uh, you know, uh, to create uh, some sort of a stepping stone over the next 10, uh, 20, or 25 years? And, and that's, uh, I think, uh, still in the making. Um, how would you like to see it is something that I think I will leave to both uh, Mr. Joshi and uh, General Manian to try mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, outline for us. Well, to Tanvi's easy question, I have an easy answer. <laughs> uh, if you talk about a long-term relationship, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line, uh, you're looking at a U.S.-India partnership that works not just for the U.S. and India, but it works for the larger global architecture, which means that when you start talking of a rules-based framework prevailing, you know, uh, the, the rebuilding of multilateral institutions across the world, the rebuilding of multilateral arrangements which are rules-based. That is what India and the U.S. as the countries, as countries with deep shared values belong. And that is what they should be working towards. That is one of the deliverables which we should be working towards. And I really feel that our divergences in this, in, in, the, in the entire relationship which we have at the moment, are in the long run actually convergences. And we are, in very different ways, going to be working towards the same goals. 
I want to see a depth of operations beyond dialogues, agreements, and platforms. Um, I want to see familiarity and interoperability. I want to see an ability to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific in the fullest extent of Indo and the fullest extent of Pacific. And I want the, the relationship, however you define it, as a partnership or bilateral, able to connect to the broader partnership across the AOR uh, you know, of, of like-minded nations with, with shared values. Great, thank you. Right here. Hi, my name is Isaac Six. Uh, I serve as Director of Advocacy for um, an international NGO called Open Doors. Uh, a quick question that hasn't been touched on, a lot of references to shared values, uh, but to what extent, I'm sure there's concerns on both sides occasionally uh, on human rights issues, both in the bilateral relationship and also in the region. Um, to what extent do conversations about human rights issues, civil liberties come up in these conversations? Is it a factor that's considered? Is it being discussed? or does it fall outside of the relationships we're talking about here today? I'll quickly jump on that. It falls outside of my relationship. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a close uh, partnership and engagement, you discuss all aspects that uh, are of interest to um, both countries. Um, it depends, and, and a lot of this really depends on which uh, mechanism you're talking about, because today we have multiple mechanisms uh, uh, that provide the framework of that relationship between our two countries. And we have, uh, I've already mentioned some of them in the strategic and security sphere, um, but you have uh, also uh, mechanisms that are in the realm of uh, foreign ministries. You have uh, within the uh, ministries of, the, of home affairs, you have a, you have a, um, um, <coughs> Homeland security dialogue, you have uh, uh, a dialogue across the board, across the uh, areas of cooperation that we have. And it really uh, shows you how multifaceted that relationship has become. And so within the relevant frameworks, you, you, you do have discussions that encompass uh, issues that are uh, in, in areas uh, that you mentioned, in areas of human rights and civil liberties and so on and so forth, and, um, and uh, issues that involve uh, you know, rights of uh, um, immigrants, uh, issues that involve, uh, you know, access to um, uh, each other's uh, countries, um, um, issues that are consular in nature that involve, uh, uh, you know, uh, people in, that are living in both countries. Uh, so there are a wide range of issues uh, that uh, are discussed. And uh, as I said, I mean, uh, when you have a partnership that's this extensive and this close, uh, you uh, there's no subject that, that is not on the table. The other aspect is that uh, the engagement with both Congress and our parliament uh, also allows for a discussion with representatives uh, of people on issues that are relevant to both countries. Uh, and uh, and if, if uh, I were to go and meet uh, congressmen, we would discuss every issue uh, that uh, could be of interest to that particular um, congressman. And at the same time, uh, I'm sure uh, in our parliament, in our foreign relations uh, committee of parliament, uh, there are many issues that are relevant to our relationship that come up in which uh, we also have uh, a discussion. So as uh, parliament, as democracies, I think we have uh, the ability to engage each other in multiple formats and in, in many ways, formal and informal, that I think uh, contribute to the relationship. I mean, uh, even uh, this particular forum is in some senses uh, an engagement, um, but uh, you, if you, talk beyond engagements uh, between governments, you, you also have uh, very, very interesting exchanges that are also relevant and feed into the, ultimately, into the decision-making process. Since I don't see a question, I'm actually gonna follow up on the last one very quickly. General Minahan, this is to you. Now, I'm, you quickly pivoted off the last question, but I'm gonna follow up with you on it. and. Uh, so human rights, um, more broadly, perhaps not specifically in Indo-PACOM's lane. However, the, um, the importance of good professional military education, um, uh, is that an opportunity for the US and India 
to think more um, about the types of partner capacity building that we could do in the Indo-Pacific region and as two strong democracies in the Indo-Pacific region to partner more on um, professional military education and training for other smaller countries mm -hmm. elsewhere in the region. Yeah. I, I, beyond the relationship with the uh, US and India, building partnership capacity uh, is an essential part of, of regional stability and, and the Indo-PACOM uh, uh, mission and way forward. So I think that, that any time that you get people together in forums where you can openly discuss values and, and create that inter, interconnectivity, if you will, um, that, that, that does nothing but strengthen um, uh, you know, strengthen the relationship, strength, strengthen the way you see the challenges, and strengthen the way you handle the challenges. So I don't, I don't uh, discount anything you said on that need. Um, we found that you know there are instances where, uh, due to due to policies, that some of those uh, some of those opportunities dwindle, and that that the need for those continues and that, that when we can get uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines from countries together in a, in a professional environment to build that, uh, to build that, that that's a good thing. Okay, great, thank you.